My name is Joe Romano. I'm with Langen Engineering and Environmental Services. Um, we are a multidiscipline firm, um, uh, integrated one-stop shop. We offer mostly ground-down services. Um, as you can see from this, they're mostly uh, founded uh, in the geotechnical and in the ground-down environment. I run the survey group for the firm. Um, the firm is a 44-year-old firm. Um, mostly uh, catering to private development. We do have some public sector work, but mostly on the private side. Today we're about 820 people spread out across the world. Um, most of our offices are in the U.S. We have 21 local offices and five overseas and one planned uh, in Central America soon. And so it gives us a, a breadth of, uh, of reach, which is pretty good. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the firm. so. Uh, I just wanted to give you some background about who I am and, and where we come from. Uh, like I said, Langen is about 44 years old, and I've been here 32 years. I spent my whole career here. So you're probably wondering uh, why is a surveyor talking about BIM or, or data capture? And I want to give you a little background about that um, first before we show some examples. Um, we to to the world we live in is uh, a world of uh, 3D documentation, whether it's for a topographic survey or for a boundary survey, an air rate survey, or for an existing conditions BIM model. In our mind, it all starts with accuracy, and you know you only get the opportunity to collect data once. And everyone on this call, I'm sure, knows that uh, once you get a piece of data in the computer, you can report it to almost any accuracy you want. That does not make it any more accurate. So we uh, we we kind of approach what we do from that end. Uh, a little history about, we're going to talk mostly about scanning um, for uh, the, the data acquisition method here. So a little history, uh, Ben Cassera is the founder and, and the grandfather of the scanning world. He, he put uh, in 1996 the Cyrex scanner on the market and he took that from he was mostly in the oil industry and there's a massive amount of data in that world um, I think we all know why BIM is uh, important and I just I really like these photos it really shows you how uh, things get messed up so for those of you who don't know um, the way scanning works is it's a spatial uh, instrument um, it, it collects 3d data uh, we set the scanner up in a in a uh, vantage point, and it records horizontal distance, vertical angle, and horizontal angle. And it does that depending on the scanner. It can do that to a million, two million times a second. It's a massive amount of data. Each one of those points is accurate, um, depending on reflectivity of the surface that you're um, that you're acquiring and some of the other conditions, but the accuracy of that can vary, and it also varies with the scanner. There are many different flavors of scanners on the market, and they range from some high-end ones to some lower-end ones, and, and they all have their place and their, um, and their method. Every time we set a scanner up, um, it's called a scan world, and we use a, a host of ways to place those scans together and create one final point cloud. Um, that is where some of this survey technology or survey history comes into it and some survey knowledge. Um, early on, uh, when scanning was first marketed, um, it was marketed to surveyors. But part of the problem was there was no way for us to use any of this data. Um, a lot of earlier scanning projects were done just like this one to create a historic documentation of a facility or, or um, you know, a digital documentation of a facility um, for some records. And in fact, uh, Ben Cassera founded an organization called SciArc that that's their whole purpose. They go around the world and they document sites like this site um, so they can live on for the future. But, you know, in, we started scanning in 2002 is when we really started looking at it. And we saw it as an opportunity, and we thought there was some also good timing um, here. Um, it is a we, – we, we kind of came up with creative non-survey-based uses of the scanner. And the reason I said that is because, again, it's a lot of data to use in a traditional 
ground down survey environment. If you're doing a topographic survey, there's a lot of data here. And the files are very heavy in 2002, um, all the way to 2006, really. The software that we used to create this information was really in its infancy. Um, the, the, even the hardware could not handle the size of, the size of some of these point clouds. Um, but we, we leveraged uh, our existing client base and we brought them uh, the, the ones that understood the 3D environment, we helped them understand uh, workflows and how to collect data and use it for accurate 3D documentation above ground, interior spaces or railroads in this instance. And our first project there on the left was a little church that actually blew up and our job was to create, recreate these windows um, that could be uh, prefabricated to go back into the new church. And this probably took four weeks to create this whole drawing. Um, in 2006, we got a little better and we were creating cross sections and profiles uh, of some data. If you fast forward that, um, today we create full Revit based existing condition models and they're what we call survey grade models. Um, we came to that uh, road because we saw that the GSA was given out existing condition BIM um, contracts, and we had, were fortunate enough to win a few of those. That helped us understand some of the workflows and some of the advantages and disadvantages to 3D capture. And again, um, it, there was uh, there was a lot of learning steps here and a lot of uh, uh, a lot of hard lessons, but I think we, we've gotten to the point now where uh, there's some really good service providers out there that can collect this type of data for you. Uh, and also the software and the hardware advancements, just like being able, to, even this today, to show a live webinar uh, of some videos um, is, is wasn't available back then. Um, this is, I was talking earlier about using it for topographic mapping, and there's a lot of data here. For those of you who work in a civil environment or a roadway environment where you're just doing cross sections, this is a lot of data just to pull out a cross section of a road or a bridge height as uh, shown in the bottom. Um, but there are advantages. So in an area where you can't do a road closure or you're in an unsafe environment, the scanner lets you pick that data up without putting a surveyor or an engineer or somebody in harm's way. And it, it's it's a great tool for that. Um, it's also, again, in an area where you cannot a easily access or you have to have, a, a in this instance, a, a uh, track closure, which is very costly if you're putting a surveyor out there on the track. This can be done remotely, and it, it allows you to pull up that survey grade data um, and then re produce models from it. These two models that you're seeing here on the right are actually 3D PDFs, which is a, a very good tool that we found um, is useful for um, providing our clients with an easy accessible and easy viewable um, representation of the model. So you don't have to, again, the files are very heavy. Sometimes you need specialized software to view it. Uh, this allows um, for almost anybody to use uh, and view the model. Um, early on in the projects, in our, in our history um, of doing this scanning work, contractors were one of the, believe it or not, contractors took the lead on what we were doing. They saw the advantages early on of being able to uh, prefabricate and understand the existing conditions before they went into a space. And uh, this model here is probably familiar to a bunch of people, the building, but this was one where we did not do a lot of the modeling in-house, and it is what led us to now we do all our modeling in-house, and it was a lesson learned on our part, and that lesson was um, controlling the data. We had shipped this out to be modeled to a sub-consultant, and it came back, and it was not uh, represent representative of the whole point cloud and uh, we decided at that point to do our stuff in-house and and you can see a, t a couple times through that point cloud you could see targets on the walls those targets are what we use to control the point cloud and control the point cloud to get it into a correct horizontal and vertical datum being a firm that does multiple services um, and as BIM is involved, more and more agencies are now starting to look at BIM-enabled deliverables. So we have to come up with a way or a workflow that allows us to bring our traditional services into this environment. And this is a campus-wide 
um, 3D model. We scan the exterior, even though I said earlier we usually don't scan topography. Um, the image on the bottom left is the mass model um, inside Revit with, uh, you can see through the building and see some of the floors. Um, so the, the idea here was to build a new addition to this building in the parking lot with tie-ins tie at the second and third floor of that glass building. On the right, we combined it with our traditional survey services where we uh, used utility data and even the foundation plans for the existing building and modeled all that and supplied one full Revit model. There's still some glitches uh, on our side on the Revit uh, for topography. Maybe George can touch on some of that when, when he speaks. Uh, a lot, a lot of our work is MEP work. Um, this is a hospital uh, in its U.S. on the East Coast. Um, we were hired by the contractor here to uh, help them understand all the existing conditions. Uh, this is a, a middle floor that was going to be re repurposed and they needed to understand the MEP above and below it and they wanted to prefab as much as they could prior to uh, so they would have as least interruption as possible. Um, often we're asked what happens when the pipe goes in. You know, a lot of times you have a pipe go in a wall at one elevation, come out a wall at another elevation. Um, there needs to be a lot of conversation between the data provider, us, and the rest of the team. Um, to, to make sure that those things are understood. Otherwise, a lot of fingers get pointed at. My guys really like, too, being in the scrubs here. They all thought they were doctors. Um, this is the final model of that product, uh, of that project, and uh, it's a very, very, very heavy file um, to transfer, and we transfer data like this uh, most of the time by mailing and FedExing hard drives back and forth. This is a infrastructure project. Again, it's... Um, all completed inside Revit, and uh, I don't know if my mouse is viewable, but the image in the upper right is going to be, this is a double-decked roadway, and this area is going to get filled in by uh, multi-story towers and parking decks, and they needed to understand how this facade related to the to each other um, in 3D, and this was a great tool for the team to use uh, to understand uh, that information. So here's a quick fly-through of that, and again, this is all Revit-based uh, survey grade type of information. The team uh, who worked on this project, uh, the architect was actually in London. The owner was here in the U.S. and uh, we did this uh, by uh, using a local surveying firm coupled with uh, our own surveyors who flew out there and did some of the work. Uh, <clears throat> Harry touched on 3D printing. Um, we use 3D printing a lot. Uh, you can see on the upper left there is a proposed, actually that's a proposed Lowe's where we brought it to a planning board. Uh, it's really good for an MEP tool. It lets people touch and see what um, what's going on in the office space on the upper right. We were asked to create a model of a, of a tree for an artist in Central Park, which uh, uh, Microsoft was able to do for us. It was a pretty interesting use of capturing data uh, in an environment we never thought of. That's one of the cool things about doing this. I mean, we have seven of these scanners running around, um, and it's brought us to a lot of unique places. What's coming up on the horizon, you might have heard about mobile mapping. It's, it's, a, it's a system that is integrated on a vehicle. It uses GPS, multi-survey scanners, uh, multi-scanners, um, and vid this one uses video in conjunction with video. And it allows you to, this one here in particular, allows you to work in the video, but referencing the point cloud in the back. And it, we're starting to see where it allows for automated dat data extraction. It'll do signs, edge of road. Um, it'll do some utility poles, and it, it brings that into a GIS world. The images in the bottom left that are moving around, you may see them ghosted because you can actually see them in 3D with 3D glasses. Uh, I think this is a, a really uh, cool use of the technology. What's coming up in the uh, in the future? You can see drones. Uh, everybody's heard about drones or UAVs or UASs. Everybody has different terminology for them. Um, there's three images. There's uh, the one on the upper left and the bottom right are uh, rotor-mounted, uh, helicopter-based one. We own the one on the bottom right, and we're working closely with the university because with a university to fly these. Uh, if you heard on the press, there's a lot of negative press um, and some 
you know, the FAA is uh, issued licenses for some universities to fly it. The bottom left is a very interesting project. That's a scanner mounted to a uh, drone, and that's in, flown in France. It's pretty cool technology. And the upper right is uh, an image supplied to us from Autodesk, and it's an image of using reality capture uh, using photography. And uh, George is going to touch on that a little more, so I'm going to skip that. One of the other problems we saw early on was there's no standards. Uh, anybody who's on this call and wanted to hire a survey provider, they would not know where to go to get that, uh, a blank RFP. Uh, the AIA has uh, templates for design, uh, level 100 to th uh, 500, but that's mostly design related. So uh, a few of us got together and we um, put together this organization called the USIBD. Um, welcome anybody to visit the website. There's some downloadable RFP templates, and we're working on um, some other templates. There, you can also get some information on standards through the GSA. They have two books, and there's this also the International Property Measurement Standard Coalition, which is also trying to put out standards. But we think that standards will be very important again because the accuracy uh, and the downstream use of that accuracy is important to uh, not only to the provider, to the designer, and to the owner. And last, you know, there's some considerations here. You know, the project requirements: does it need what type of data uh, uh, reality capture do you need? Are they long-term assets? People that have long-term assets can leverage the downstream use of it again um, over and over, and, and that's where that accuracy the first time plays into that. Um, and you can do that by making a, a team event and making sure that everybody that you can think of that has need that data get involved with collecting the data and the specifications that are required for it. Um, there is a large upfront cost, but there's a large return. Uh, there's a, there is no easy button. There is some software that George will touch on um, that has made this more automated, but there's still a heavy user interface. Um, so while the field work is collected quickly, some of the down the office work is a little bit um, uh, costly and time uh, inherent. Uh, the workflows and the procedures will evolve. Um, I think the rest of these are pretty, uh, you know, are pretty. Um, Self-explanatory. One thing that's not, you know, you got to be open-minded, and you got to find a survey, a service provider that's willing to educate you, and educate uh, the team on the use of the data, of the data, and um, the horror stories, the pros and the cons of using it. Otherwise, uh, what we've seen happen is you'll be somebody will become a nay naysayer in organization, and they'll discredit the the technology as opposed to discrediting the provider. So. Um, I think that that's pretty important. Thank you, Joe. You know, the, you've just seen a really uh, great example of, of one of, uh, you know, our customers using the technology for real-world projects. Uh, that's the whole point. And, you know, I'm here to kind of expound on that, talk about Autodesk and reality capture, uh, what we have to offer for products and services. Uh, but first, let me just introduce myself. My, na my name is George Hatch. I am a senior technical specialist for Autodesk. I do focus on the east coast of the United States in Canada, and I focus primarily on our ENI products, which is engineering, natural resources, and infrastructure. So uh, most of the civil engineering and structural engineering products. However, my degree is in architecture, in industry experiences in GIS and civil engineering. I also have some, some CFD, simulation and analysis background. So I'm really kind of uh, uniquely placed here to talk to you about multiple different solutions around reality capture. Because let's face it, uh, every project exists somewhere, and that's what we're going to talk about is the existence of reality around your projects. Where are your projects? Whether you're working on buildings, bridges, utilities, or roadways, each one of these individual project types, of course, exists somewhere. It doesn't exist in space. It exists in the context of its surrounding. And this is really important for us to, of course, understand. Now, all of us understand this fact. Uh, it's kind of a silly point to bring up, even. Uh, except for the fact that most of us start our projects 
just like this. We start our project in a design application with a blank screen. I've worked on many different types of projects, you know, through my career. Most of my civil projects, we would start with some sort of base survey. Uh, but even beyond, before the survey was conducted, we would usually still have a base screen and we would start from there. And the reality is we're designing around something most of the time. So why not start our project with a context like a scan? Maybe it's a laser scan. Maybe it's a, uh, a model that's been built from photos, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the whole point of reality capture is to capture the existence of the reality around your project so that you're better informed and can move forward with the design. It creates a much more accurate, much more informed design right from the beginning of your project. Now, there's different types of uh, scanning equipment out there. There's airborne laser scanning, mobile scanning, handheld devices, and uh, the ability to convert photos to 3D models. And we're going to talk about those different forms and how what they look like. Uh, I will just say this, when it comes to airborne laser scanning, the level of detail um, is, is not necessarily going to be a level of survey grade detail. You won't have as many points in an area as you would with a mobile solution. You know, handheld scanners, like you, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but a handheld scanner, uh, scanner like a Farrell arm would, is great for small scale building a model, but not necessarily for building an entire uh, scan of a building, of course. And then photo, uh, photogrammetry or the ability to take photos and build models from those photos is amazing when you're starting a project and it has its own level of accuracy. So understanding these different forms and the level of accuracy and when to use these different forms of scanning is, is really important. You need to understand that. And we can get into a lot more detail, but since we only have a half an hour, I probably won't get into too much detail there. So let's talk about the cost of data. You know, when you're starting to talk about laser scanning, over the years traditionally we've been looking at you know, laser scanners in the 120K mark or higher. That was your entry level scanner. Um, you know, these days the cost of scanning has gone considerably. Now the numbers, you know, are plus or minus uh, probably 5K, 10K. Um, but when you look at the two difference, the difference in the price of, you know, these two specific types of scanners, um, both Leica, Faro, Tocton, um, have all brought the cost of their scanning down considerably. It means that, you know, Joe Engineers, this, a small firm, can start to get into this space uh, at, a, at a cost that makes a little bit more sense to them. Now, I am going to throw this up there. You know, we've talked about free scan data, and uh, this is where my caveat on accuracy comes into play. Most of you uh, may or may not be familiar with GIS. Now, most states provide, I happen to have PASA, which is um, Pennsylvania's, GIS site in Rhode Island GIS here, Mass GIS, New York uh, GIS. There's there's a ton. Every state likely has their own GIS portal, but many times states are going to fly the state. Uh, they'll pay to have the state flown, and they'll provide laser scan data, aerial laser scan data for consumption uh, for your project. Now keep in mind, this is not going to be something that will uh, replace a traditional survey or a more accurate scan, as Joe was talking about earlier, but it is something that we can utilize at the beginning of a project, and it's free. That's, that's the best part, that it's free. And we have tools here at Autodesk I'm going to talk about in a moment that will help you consume that free data. 
But the, the overall idea here is that the cost of data and the cost of entry into scanning and uh, the ability to consume scan data is dropped dramatically. So let's talk about the Autodesk Recap product line. We do have kind of three different buckets here. We have Autodesk Recap, which is the product that ships with our suite. Uh, you can also download it from our, our, our website. And then we have Recap Pro and then Recap 360. And we'll talk about some of the differences in these three different uh, specific products, but all of them have to do with reality capture. Recap allows us to do edit, visualize um, our, our, our scans, uh, or maybe it was a, three, a 360 photo model that we've built, and we bring that into Recap and make edits to the point clouds. And it also converts those point clouds into a format that can, can be consumed in our hero products like Civil 3D or Revit or Navisworks. We also have, you know, it, sorry, did somebody need to say something? I just had a feedback, I guess, on my end, no worries. Uh, we also have Recap Pro. Recap Pro allows us to do targetless scan to scan registration. So rapid field data preparation, a lot of customers that are using our targetless registration are doing their registration in the field. Um, this is this is a big shift in the way that we do scanning, uh, and and there are workflows that 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 can that can be very effective. Also tying that survey data, the scan data, into survey control. Um, with three six uh, with Recap three sixty, we have the ability to create photos from uh, create three D models from photos as well as sharing those scans with, uh, with people via the cloud. Instead of sending an email, why not just send a link and they can download via the cloud and, and possibly even view uh, via the cloud. So uh, let's jump into Recap on its own. Recap is a, a product that allows us to consume point cloud data that has already been processed. What I mean by that is that it's already been uh, cleaned up, it's already been stitched together, meaning all the different scan locations have been stitched together, and you have one single scan um, or a combination of scans already aligned. In recap, though, we can go through, of course, we can visualize, as you're seeing here, we can visualize fly-throughs of the model and the scan data. Uh, and then we can get into making edits as well. Uh, when we talk about making edits to the point cloud, in Recap, we have the ability here to isolate out certain points using different tools. Like you can see here, we have bounding boxes. Uh, we can make selections uh, by just circling a ton of points and then breaking them into different regions. You see here that there's a tank that needs to be, you know, basically replaced. And we can do remove the physical points from the recap model inside of recap and then utilize that scan data inside of a hero application. You'll see that workflow in just a bit. So let's talk about our our ability to absorb points into recap over the years and Joe kind of touched on this, uh, there is a ton of data inside of these scans. In fact, when I say a ton, uh, we were talking about, uh, in back in the 2013 product lines, we were talking about 2 billion points could be consumed uh, inside of Recap and our, 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 our hero product. Now in 2014 plus or 2015, we have the ability to consume 20 billion points. And that's a huge difference, of course, but even just consider 2 billion points seems like a really big number, and it is a really big number, but it is not uncommon to have a scan that hits 2 billion points, if not 
blow that out of the water. So it was really important as a company that we uh, changed our model and, and continue to increase performance as the level of your data increases, as it will. The, the level of detail of your point cloud determines on how you, how you uh, set that up in the field, but at the end of the day, the more accurate and the more higher level of detail you have in your point cloud, of course, the better off you'll be in the end of a project for, you know, whether it's construction verification or a layout of a new design. Uh, for visual purposes, you can see that behind this, um, my, my call outs here, graphics wise, there's a pretty big difference. There's technically three images here broken up, one to the left, one down the center, and another to the right. It's the same scan data, but consumed in uh, different releases of our product. And you can see originally we could really only consume black and white, low resolution, I'll say, scan data. And, you know, we've progressed to be able to have color scan data at a better resolution. But as we progress um, to 2014 and 2015 products, our resolution and ability to consume that scan uh, is much, much more clear. And the the ability to stream the scan inside the product is much, much more um, capable as well. So let's jump to, you know, we talked about point clouds and we talked about recap consuming point clouds. What are the different types of point clouds that recap can currently consume? Recap by itself without recap Pro for registration, we'll talk about in a moment, can consume these different point cloud formats. And the good news is that most of your scanners, no matter your manufacturer, will be able to at least export to this file format. This means that whether you've done the scan yourself or you're working with a third-party firm that is doing the scanning, they'll be able to provide recap-ready files so that you can do your editing and cleaning up. And uh, maybe it's not editing or cleaning up, but you want to uh, section off part of your project, you can do that all within Recap. As long as you have this file format, Recap will consume it. So let's talk about Recap Pro. Recap Pro targetless registration uh, is a different workflow. And in the past, with traditional scanning, you would set up targets that look very similar to this. And the point is that you would set those targets up, and then when it was time to uh, bring all of your different scans together or stitch them or build a single model from those multiple scans, you would basically use these targets to align your scans. And with Recap Pro, we basically remove that process, and you can use almost anything in your pro in your scans to use for targetless registration. This is uh, has several different be benefits: uh, less time on site for preparation, additional scans post registration, meaning that in the traditional workflow, if I had done all my scans, taken down my target, and gone back to the office. The ability to add more ad additional scans after the fact uh, was a headache, to say the least. Now, this is not necessarily always going to be the case where you can always use targetless registration. There are vertical applications where this works really well. There are horizontal applications where uh, the ability to have targets is going to make a little bit more sense for your workflow. But with Recap Pro's targetless registration, there really isn't anything out, out there that can compete with the way we set up our registration. You'll see that in just a little bit. Um, and then we have advantage knowledge of the stand target placement that was required. You needed to know where to set up all of those different targets prior to doing your scanning. 
Uh, and like I said, adding adding targets or or taking those targets down, going back to your office and realizing you need to put them back up, then more scans was a problem. And then, of course, on-site registration. Right now, the workflow for most scanning firms is to do your scans out in the field, bring all those scans back, and then register in the office, which means that you don't know whether or not you needed more data until you're back in the office. Why not register on site so that you know you have a full model uh, before you pack your truck out for the day? So let's talk about targetless registration as a demonstration here. So the first thing that you do in Recap Pro is you set up a project. And this project is a local project sitting on your desktop, which is important to know. Now, just in full disclosure, these scans that I use are low-resolution scans, and they're black and white. And I do that so that we can show kind of this process uh, fast, um, meaning fast for the presentation. It's still fast in comparison to what the traditional workflow is, uh, but you don't want to sit here for a minute while we see registration process. So the next piece is that we choose our foam scan. This is basically where we want to start stitching our models together. Now the best part about Recap Pro is that you'll see here that we don't have to choose very specific targets, meaning we don't have to be really accurate. You see that I picked a trash can. Now maybe the trash can isn't a good example because it could move technically, uh, but then I'm going to pick the wall. I'm going to pick a wall in two similar locations in these two different scans that are side by side. And then I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to pick a column location, a bottom of a column location. And what happens is Recap then analyzes those two scans based on the points that I selected, and it will use those points as two uh, as, I'm sorry, has three points to align those two scans to. And then it forgets, once the scans are, are generally aligned, it forgets about those points and then uses common spaces to align your scans. This is a really fast and accurate way to align uh, multiple different scan locations. You see here I'm taking my third scan location and picking my common point. And it's nice to be able to have side-by-side -side views of your of your scans. You see that I picked a you know just above a flange on one of those beams, and I'm going to pick another column. These are my uh, this is basically my review of those scans as it processes. It's going to then uh, register now this third scan into the overall model. Uh, now uh, I approve that scan. And I let this load. Now, what it's doing in the background as I index my scans, you're going to see um, in a moment that it's going to index the scan. And yes, I do take a jump here, I think. I don't know that I, I let it play all the way through. Um, maybe I did. Uh, as it indexes these scans, what it's doing is it's setting the scan up so that we can consume it inside of the host application. If you've done scanning before, you've worked with point data in the past, when you try to bring that into AutoCAD or bring that into a product like Civil 3D or Revit, for instance, those point clouds really chugged, meaning they, they took forever to load and it was really hard to manipulate and move around them. Uh, but with the recap engine inside those different products, which I'll talk about in a moment, it was really easy to um, to manipulate and move around those 3D scans because of the process that we just went through. So let's move on to the recap product line, the recap engine. Right now, the recap engine fits within AutoCAD-based products, Navisworks, Revit, Inventor, InfraWorks, InfraWorks 360, which isn't listed here, but is basically the same as InfraWorks as far as its engine is concerned. 
Civil 3D, Map 3D, Plant 3D, and 3DS Max. 3DS Max is an exciting new feature. Um, but when we talk about integration into those different products, that is why Recap uh, really matters. We talk about a building renovation. You're, you're looking here at a scan that is um, a, a scan of a um, our tech shop in California, and you know, simply adding uh, some dimensions here, we can we can check dimensions, we can lay out walls, uh, you, we can lay out uh, floors as you're seeing here. And what the key is is we're we're actually using the scan as the base model. Now there's a couple of different workflows. Joe showed some amazing examples of using the the scan to build a Revit model. So you build a Revit model around that scan, use the scan as your base. And that is a workflow that absolutely makes a lot of sense in some situations. But in a scenario like this where uh, you don't necessarily need everything to be modeled, why not just use the scan as the model uh, and add to it or remove as you see fit? Let's talk about road visualization, and maybe in a Civil 3D application like this, where we bring that scan into Civil 3D. Right now, this is visualizing that scan inside of Civil 3D. Uh, you'll notice that to that last view just showed several different locations that were identified inside of that scan. And being able to look at this in three dimensions while laying out our alignments, our uh, cross sections or corridors, all using the scan itself as our base, uh, is is of course a much more practical solution than you know starting from nothing. Now, when we talk about scan and accuracy and control, um, I love that Joe started this presentation and and the way he started it was saying. Why is the surveyor talking about BIM? For every single person on this phone call right now, no matter what stage of your project you work on, no matter what types of projects you work on, every BIM project starts with survey. And when we talk about scans, it's really important to understand what level of detail and what level of accuracy you're getting out of that scan data. What I'm talking about here is being able to consume survey-grade scan data inside of a product like Civil 3D and using that data uh, to design and visualize your project in different ways. What about construction verification? This is a really practical use for scanning. Uh, to When we talk about as-built, to compare designed models to a scan, um, allows us to do rapid development of as-built checks or construction verification, whether it's uh, for, you know, of course, HVAC equipment like you see here, or it could be, um, you know, utilities or, of course, rudimentary wall layouts, floor placements, stairs, railings, everything. Um, you can compare your scan data to the model itself. Now, the, the, one of the last things that I'll talk about with our integration into the product is clash detection. And 2015 products we now have, especially here for Navisworks, we have the ability to isolate the scan itself based on the clash. So you'll see here as I zoom out a little bit, I've got a, an object that has clashed with the point cloud, but it's not, instead of saying that that single object, let me pause it there. Instead of saying that this single object clashed with the entire cloud, it will isolate the region of that cloud that is an issue. And you can see here by just basically hiding everything else, we can isolate the issue and take a look at that in a lot better detail than we could previously in other releases. This goes to show you that as a company, Autodesk is putting a lot of effort into this technology and how it fits into your workflow. In fact, we I, I'm 
constantly in front of customers up and down the East Coast, really all over the U.S., and asking them how they're using this technology. And sometimes, frankly, they are not using it the way I intended or thought that, you know, Recap and Navisworks or Civil 3D or Revit would be used. But it's interesting to learn about how they use the technology so that we can help bring that knowledge back to our developers and those developers can apply uh, that workflow to something that uh, they're developing in-house here. So um, I just continue through the same workflow. If you're familiar with Navisworks, what you're seeing here is, is not uncommon as far as uh, a clash detection on other types of objects, but the ability to do this with scan data in 2015 is is really impressive uh, and and much more functional than uh, previous releases. Uh, so structural visualization and verification, maybe of bridges. Of course, we can visualize inside of Recap itself, but maybe we bring this scan data into a product like Infraworks. Infraworks is uh, one of my personal favorite products to show these days. Uh, it's a very exciting infrastructure product that allows us to show the context of our project in its surroundings. And when we talk about reality capture, isn't that what we're, what we're talking about, is the context of a project in its surroundings. So the ability to integrate the scanned world into a product like Infraworks and see all the context of the surroundings not just the ob single object that we happen to be scanning uh, is, you know, of course, of course, going to add value to your workflows. So, uh, before we get into recap photo and my last one minute slide, uh, I just want to show you know we've got many different areas of uh, of different industries here that we can utilize recap data and utilize reality capture information, uh, whether that's from a, a photo or whether that's from scanned, um, traditional scanned aerial or mobile LIDAR. Uh, and we can bring that into, of course, our different various different products. But the last thing that I'll talk to you about that's exciting is Recap 360. Now, Recap, Recap Pro and Recap 360, of course, are three different offerings. Recap Pro is absolutely recommended for everyone that is doing their own registration and detailed work on clouds. Recap 360 allows you to share point clouds via the Autodesk 360 cloud. I know that's a little confusing, I'm talking about two different clouds. So via the Internet versus um, anything else. So we can share a cloud that's been developed on our desktop via the Internet uh, through Recap 360. Or we can use Recap 360 to build from pictures. Now this is a, a, a real, in fact, this, this gentleman that's doing the flying the um, hexacopter or the octocopter here, uh, it's a GoPro with a Hero 3. Um, camera on it. His name's Dominic. He works here at Autodesk. He did this project. And by flying this drone around this specific battery uh, and taking a bunch of photos, he was able to then drag those photos into Recap 360. Once the project had all been submitted, he was then, you know, able to then go into the Recap model itself. This is what came out of both. Now, this is not survey grade accuracy, but when we talk about starting a project from nothing, don't we all start with photos anyway? Don't we go out to a site and take pictures of that site? Why not take those pictures and make a model out of those pictures? Now, you can take pictures from a drone like you saw in this video, or you can take them by hand. The, the idea is that you get the whole scope of, or a big, large portion of the scope of your project in your window of view when you take your pictures. But then you take that same content, just like you've seen in, in previous videos, you take that same content into a product here like Revit 
where we start to lay out geometry inside of Revit. Maybe we cut cross section, uh, draw elevation. Uh, maybe we start laying out the new geometry, like here they're, they're doing some um, math modeling for a, uh, an addition, basically, that's going to go on top of this, uh, this battery. Now, this isn't a real project, just so you know. This is totally <laughs> a fake project. A realistic example of what could be done using recap photo. Talk about preliminary designs and concepts. Uh, this is this is very accurate, not survey grade accuracy. But once you add survey grade accuracy to this data, that's what a BIM project is. It's a life cycle of a project. 